Done and done. It's all yours, chair, co-chairs. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the uh, December 8th meeting of the uh, Brooklyn Community Board 14's uh, Community Environment, Cultural Affairs, and Economic Development Committee uh, meeting. Uh, this meeting was originally scheduled um, to occur, um, let me see if I can get my dates right, on the, I believe it was the 17th. Sean, am I right there? Of, of November, uh, yeah. we had to postpone. Uh, there were some scheduling conflicts. Uh, so we're holding that November meeting now on the 8th, uh, which is today of December. Uh, it is now 6.33 uh, p.m. Uh, we'll bring the meeting to order. Uh, just a few um, housekeeping items. Um, I'm being, um, uh, oh, oh, my co-chair, Barton Prasant, is uh, going to be um, running through the agenda for the meeting today, and um, I'll be managing the chat. Um, so he'll be introducing all of the presenters. Um, we're joined by, I believe, most of our committee members, uh, our, our district manager, and a few of our fellow board members. So uh, just for housekeeping purposes, um, I need to mention that the board has an obligation to conduct its business in an orderly manner. So any person preventing the meeting from continuing will be muted or possibly connected from the meeting. Um, with that, uh, we'll make it nice and simple and I'll pass uh, the baton over to Barton. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Our uh, first presentation this evening is from the NYC Department of Environmental Protection on their rainfall ready and cloudburst management programs. We have Mario Bruno, the Assistant Commissioner of Intergovernmental Affairs, and I believe it's Denise Hubbard. I, I caught the Hubbard, but I apologize if I get the first name wrong. Um, last time I saw Commissioner Bruno present was on flooding issues, specifically how they pertained to the north end of our district. And I must say he is one of the most forthright uh, members of a government organization that I've seen present before us in the past. And so for those of you who have uh, serious questions, you can expect straightforward answers from him. And with that encomium, I will pass it on to you, Commissioner Hubbard. I'm Commissioner Bruno. That's right. Denise yeah. deserves to be commissioner. She there worked you so go. Nice recovery for me. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna um, I'm I'm gonna switch the order. Um, my colleague Alan Cohen is joining us tonight, and he's gonna he's uh, one of our experts on uh, green infrastructure and sustainability from our bureau from. Uh, environmental planning for analysis. So uh, I'm gonna let Alan um, introduce himself and he's gonna give a really extensive presentation on uh, uh, Cloudburst, our Cloudburst initiative. Alan. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I have uh, a lot of slides. Um, I'll try to uh, not spend too much time, um, but I did want to uh, introduce um, the Cloudburst program. Um, for those of you who are not already familiar with it, we did have a uh, webinar um, in September. So some of you uh, may have joined then, and if so, a lot of this will look um, very familiar, um, but please feel free to um, speed me along um, or let me know if, if I have any um, time limits. Am I able to um, uh, share my screen? I, like. I made you the presenter a minute ago, and I'm showing that you are. So do you have the. Um, I think I just have to change the settings on my end. Um, that might take me a minute. So um, all right, I don't know if you want to launch into anything else while I do that, but otherwise, just give me a second. Um, sure thing. Sure thing, Alan. Yeah, and after Alan goes, I'm I'm going to do a presentation um, on um, you know rainfall ready, stormwater preparedness. By that time, I expect uh, uh, our borough manager for water and sewer maintenance to join us, uh, Mark Greenberg. And Mark, will, you know all the complaints that come through the community board and your elected officials. I route to Mark, and 
you know, Mark and I, we're, we're, we're on the emails all day and sometimes all night uh, taking care of things. So he's terrific. So Mark will be joining us uh, later. He's one of the people behind the scenes that, uh, well, helps take care of everything in Brooklyn. Now, Alan? Brave, brave man to join us. <laughs> all right, it's, sorry, it's making me um, quit and come back. So let me try this one second. It might drop off for a second. Let's see. Is it worth reversing the order, Commissioner, or? Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, uh, what do you think, Alan? Yeah, it's not working for me for some reason, so I'm going to have to sign it out and, and sign back in. So if you want to do All right, I'll, I'll try and start yeah, mine up. Okay. Mine is shorter. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Awesome. I'm beginning to miss the days of the projector on the wall, though. <laughs> I hear that. Everybody see that? Looks perfect. Yes. Okay. So, um, Rainfall Ready is a plan that the city um, devised um, that the, talks about the shared responsibilities of New Yorkers and city government combat uh, to, that we can can do to combat intense storms together. And we have a website called uh, at nyc.gov forward slash Rainfall Ready. And you know this chart is just to give examples of how you know the responsibilities of the city you know, mainly DEP and OEM and individual New Yorkers can play. Um, you know, we've published an interactive flood map. I can put that link in the chat. And that's that's basically, um, it's a map based on elevations because in a lot of places, whether you're at the bottom of, sometimes you could be at the bottom of a hill or at the bottom of, of a natural basin formed by the elevation of, of, of the land that your neighborhood was built on and and low elevations attract stormwater, you know, by gravity and, and they, there's more of a risk for overland flooding. There's more of a risk of, of you know, uh, and it can even be more of a risk of sewer surcharge because the uh, of the water traveling downhill in the sewer. Um, we've put, we've given out about um, 4,000 flood barriers since the summer um, in all five boroughs, and those are water inflatable flood barriers. It's not a solution, it's a band aid. But you know what? Um, not every storm is Ida or Henri. And for uh, there, are, there are storms where less water can fall in a neighborhood and still flood some homes. So these flood barriers, you can stack them up to a foot high, you can back them up with sandbags. And they do work to prevent flooding. Um, um, so, what we want, and on the on the individual side, we want you to use the flood map to understand your risk, get flood insurance if you can, and really important is to sign up for notify NYC. Um, the city uh, on the city side, when we're preparing for the storm, we activate the flash flooding plan. Uh, Bureau of Water and Sewer Operations inspects chronic flooding locations. We issue travel advisories and parks lowers lakes. And that's important in this neighborhood being where, you know, Prospect Park uh, has such a big lake. Uh, on, on New Yorker's side, we, we really encourage people to take it upon themselves. Clear the debris from your curb when you know the storm is imminent. If you see stuff on top of a catch basin, you can call DEP. We go to the we go to the most important bases, the ones at the worst elevations, and try to make sure they're clear. But we have one hundred fifty thousand; we can't check them all in one day. So 
if you see garbage on a catch basin and you can grab on top of a catch basin, you can grab a shovel and broom. It's okay to pick it up. If the wood is already building up, turn the broom handle over and poke out one of the grill holes. Um, and you'll see the water go down. That was a little game I played growing up uh, <laughs> on 76th Street and 10th Avenue. It fascinated me. Maybe that's why I became an engineer. Um, you should always stock up supplies to get ready to be ready for any emergency. And if you have belongings in your basement, that's where the greatest risk of flooding is. Elevate your belongings. Uh, don't keep anything of value or importance on the floor. Uh, on the other side about monitoring conditions, DEP is actually expanding our network of flooding sensors. Um, um, we monitor traffic cameras uh, to see what the weather on the ground is uh, to and the best way to deploy you know, emergency responders. And of course, we must throw all our resources for storms, make sure that the, the, that every slot is covered, whether on uh, on schedule or in overtime. Uh, if there is a bad storm, stay home, and don't drive or walk. And finally, you know, um, after the storm, we deploy resources for the cleanups, the support cleanups, the resolved flooded roadways. We ask you to document damages, submit claims to the controllers, and, and before you uh, call us or call the community board, use the 301 app or use the uh, 301 website. Get a 301 complaint in. Uh, DP, I can speak for my agency. I mentioned Mark Greenberg before. His, you know, he has guys working on shifts in, in uh, various sectors around Brooklyn, around the city. So at any time you put a 301 complaint about water and sewer flooding, it's going to go to somebody who's on duty. And, and, you know, they have a way of triaging it, but they get to the most in, imminent uh, complaints uh, first. Um, the stormwater resiliency vision uh, that we're developing outlines plans to make New York City more resilient. And that's through um, the, employing green and gray infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, we have 7,000 miles of sewer and um, they're not designed to handle the, the amount of rainfall that we saw in Henri and Ida, uh, most sewers can handle between one and one and 1.75 inches of rain. Uh, Ida dumped at times over 3.5, over three inches of rain per hour, which is why the flooding was so bad. Um, what we're working on is that is we're still going through the process of upgrading our sewer system, which is ironically, the whole sewer system isn't built in New York City. Um, much of the development that happened in southern Queens, you know, the su southern parts of, of uh, Queens and, and um, Brooklyn after World War II and the Korean War and Staten Island, there was a lot of places built that don't that, that they were allowed to build without um, storm sewers. So we're still doing new storm. We're still putting, completing the system, adding areas and maybe the, that weren't in the drainage plan. At the same time, um, we're upgrading the system. So the last five years, we built uh, um, 125 miles of new upgraded sewers. Um, we complete emergency upgraded and repairs at 14 um, of the worst condition in Staten Island, Queens, which get the worst flooding in New York City. And we adopted new catch basin designs to help stormwater flow into the sewers more easily. Um, we're doing a huge build out in Southeast Queens, as I said before, um, where there aren't any storm sewers and we're building blue belts in Staten Island. One other thing about blue belts is we usually build them where there are existing water courses. We're now evaluating places for blue belts that don't have water courses, but are at the right elevation to build, you know, blue, blue belt, which is basically a pond to hold storm water. Um, our vision is to upgrade at least 70 miles of sewer per year, about 1% of the sewer system using data to target the most at-risk communities. But we're still taking input from uh, the public and the community boards because our data isn't always 100% correct. And sometimes, you know, we don't get 3-1 complaints where there's bad flooding. So your, 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 your input's really important to us. And we want to complete sewer build out in unserved areas. Um, you know, we're, we're expanding green infrastructure. We've built 11,000 green infrastructure assets, um, all in combined sewer areas. That means Brooklyn, Queens, and, and the Bronx. Um, 
uh, we're starting to use other areas, which Alan's going to talk about, uh, medians, um, um, playgrounds, basketball courts, any any area where, where we can, um, whether it's public or private, which we can turn to an area that can that can detain stormwater and keep it out of the storm sewer system. And our vision is to expand green infrastructure, partner with uh, state and federal governments to uh, finance to financially support these grant uh, these efforts and develop a robust maintenance program that grows a green workforce to maintain all this uh, GI storm preparedness. Um, you know, key city agencies like OEM. DP and, and DOT respond to a storm emergencies. Uh, the flash flood emergency, uh, the flash flood emergency plan, is is coordinated through the response of multiple agencies. DP obviously and OEM are the major stakeholders. We have um, uh, each year um, these agencies attend a pre-hurricane season briefing. We we go through weather outlooks from the National Weather Service, and the coastal storm plan is reviewed. And DEP holds a preseason hurricane and flash flood plan call with field operations management to review our internal plans. This is a picture of a catch basin and being cleaned. So um, this is what we do when, when the inside of the catch basin is full. We, we actually pick up the top and we have this, uh, this neat equipment that it's a bucket that goes in and, and pulls it out. But when uh, uh, New York City Emergency Management activates the flash flood, um, plan. Um, DEP activates their internal uh, flood plan. We begin inspecting chronic flood locations. A lot of them are in those low-lying areas on the stormwater map. We make sure we're staffed. We make sure our equipment's ready. And we keep feeding weather updates to our staff internally. Um, the activation includes just under 300 chronic, chronic flooding locations, uh, the, the, fl the flash flood plan. Um, you know, uh, DP, DOT, sanitation, or major, uh, major agencies involved. And we respond, we're responsible for 106 locations to do a pre-inspection around the city. Um, we watch, um, we closely watch uh, uh, conditions and respond to flooding. Um, a lot of times flood water can create surge in the sewer charge and uh, surcharge in the sewer knock off manhole covers, flood arterial roadways, and cause sewer backups. So those are kind of the big problems that we deal with during the storm. Um, and we generate situation reports, coordinate with our other agencies, and uh, monitor real-time conditions. We're also even data mining flooding locations, uh, flooding conditions in social media, which is something new. And uh, this is what happens after a storm. The water pushes all the trash and leaves on top of the grading. And whether some people don't believe it or not, but this is what back, this is what causes, this is the main cause of street flooding is trash like this. Um, but the, but the, if you look at the cutout in the back of the curb piece, we're trying to add these so that we're trying to use these design catch basins when we do new open basins or replace them. The cutout in the back does let more trash in, but there's a hood inside that blocks the outlet pipe to the sewer so the sewer doesn't collect this trash. And this does allow water to get in so that you have less tree flooding. So it's actually a very good thing that we're um, adopting this design. And um, the resources we can share are the rainfall ready site, um, the stormwater flood maps. Um, and we, of course we recommend notify NYC. I've shared both these presentations with Sean, so you all have access to them. Um, and, uh, you know, follow us on social media. And this is the, you know, the response team in Brooklyn, which includes Denise, the Community Affairs Liaison, Karen, um, uh, Ellis, the Director of Community Affairs, and myself. All three of us are native Brooklynites. Um, I was born in Park Slope. Uh, just to mention, and we also have a community affairs hotline in case you can't, in case uh, you at the community board can't reach us at the moment. Um, someone in the office will pick this line up, whether it's one of Denise's coworkers, myself, or um, or our admin staff.
And with that, you know, I can take questions. I think what I'd like to do, maybe, Mr. Cohen, if you think your setup is maybe just move straight into the cloud burst management, sure. because that may answer some questions that people may have for Commissioner Bruno. So, um, if everyone else is okay with that, uh, Mr. Cohen, go ahead. All right, let's try this again. All right, let sure. me know if you can't see that, but it should be good. Great. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about what cloud burst management is in just a moment. It's uh, it's it's building off of existing programs. So if, if you're already familiar um, with the green infrastructure program that Mario just described, um, you'll see some very um, familiar concepts uh, that, that build off of that. Um, so Mario mentioned the um, flood maps a couple of times. Um, this is a screenshot of the extreme flood scenario, um, which is akin to if rainfall like hurricane um ida was happening all over the city um luckily um it didn't happen uh all over the city in the in the same way unfortunately um parts of brooklyn and, and queens as we know got heavier um rainfall that, than the rest but uh this came out in just may um 2021 like three or four months before ida um released by um dep and and the mayor's office um and was intended to highlight that the risks um, extend uh, beyond the coast. Um, we're so familiar with the flood maps, uh, the coastal evacuation flood maps, and the um, the FEMA flood maps. But uh, heavy rain events present a a different type of risk. Um, the sewer system uh, is the first line of defense, uh, making sure that we have a fully built out uh, sewer system and it's uh, maintained appropriately. But um, these events are so intense that it's like taking, you know, if you take a, a bucket of water and pour it down the, the drain in your in your bathroom, you're good. If you take 10 buckets of uh, water and try to dump it down your drain at once, your floor is completely wet. And so there's just limits to what the, the drainage system can handle. Um, and intensity is, is really key to that. Um, so what can we do to manage water at the surface? Um, we've, uh, again, the green infrastructure program was, you know, about a decade ago. Um, the, uh, you know, first step towards building on top of the, the sewer system um, to help mitigate uh, runoff, um, but by absorbing water into the ground before it gets into the sewer system. Um, but even that isn't being built for these types of extremes, but um, we can build upon that framework to um, try to mitigate some of this risk. Again, um, the, the risks we can't necessarily build our way um, out of these risks, but we can try to buffer some of the, um, the flooding that does occur. Um, and so what we call a cloud burst is just, again, that heavy, sudden heavy downpour where you get a lot of rain in a short amount of time. If it's spread out over the course of a day, um, it's easier to manage versus if it all comes at once. And that's what we saw last summer um, when we had Henri and then Ida just a few weeks later breaking those records um, for hourly intensity. Um, and so cloudburst management is this idea of absorbing, storing, and transferring st stormwater above ground um, when everything is surcharged, um, the sewers at capacity, um, by taking the tools that we have, like green infrastructure, um, and building upon it uh, along with uh, storage above and below ground. Um, typically, we've been also we've been designing these systems to handle. Um, about 2.3 uh, inches of, of rain um, in an hour. Um, it, that is that is the sort of the goal. But even that proves challenging um, to find enough space above ground um, due to utilities, underground utilities, bedrock, uh, groundwater, and just land ownership um, and and conflicts. So. You know, this is going to, going to be a, a work in, in progress um, and and something that we can build upon, um, you know, through as we go um, by expanding green infrastructure and other approaches, um, really maximizing every space we can um, in, the, in the city. So the principles, as I mentioned, are um, absorb, uh, store and transfer water, storm water. 
um, and green infrastructure is is one of the strategies that is that we can use to absorb. Um, we can also use porous pavement, which I'll show an example of in in a few minutes. A uh, project that hold rainwater. Um, th this is already a tool that we use as part of our um, what we call our, our on site stormwater management um, for green infrastructure. Uh, so under parking lots um, with uh, our green infrastructure partners with with NYCHA and others, um, we do use underground storage, um, but you can also uh, store water above ground and I'll give an example um, of that uh, for a work for a project that we're developing right now. And then it's not enough just to create the space to store it, but you actually have to get the water there. Um, and so uh, we can use catch basins, we can um, potentially regrade the streets um, to maximize the flow into spaces that, could, that it can be safely stored. Um, and while we're doing this, we want to um, maximize the benefits by um, reducing uh, economic damages, um, maximizing the social benefits. So can we enhance public space in the process of going in and making these retrofits? Um, and to the extent possible, can we um, enhance the environmental benefits uh, by adding vegetation, reducing the uh, urban heat island, and so on? So this came out of a study we did. Um, this concept came out of a study we did in 2017. Um, we borrowed this idea uh, from Copenhagen, actually. They coined the term cloudburst management, as far as I know. Um, they had a major rate event like Ida, um, but it was 10 years before us. Um, and in 2017, we were looking at Southeast Queens as a place to potentially um, apply this concept. And we completed um, design just this last year of our first pilot project, which will hopefully go into construction soon with, uh, with NYCHA. Um, which is utilizing a series of spaces, both green spaces, as well as a basketball court on the NYCHA campus. Um, and the basketball court has underground subsurface storage, like the image I showed before. Um, but there will be above ground storage as well. You can see the basketball court is kind of lowered, creating seating in the process. Um, in a really heavy rain event, um, that creates that extra capacity um, to store uh, water at the surface. Um, and what's really key here is it's connected um, to the other green spaces, as well as the drainage um, that is coming um, from the campus and would otherwise go straight into the sewer is, is being diverted um, to these spaces. Hey, Mr. Cohen, I'm not sure how far you are through your presentation, um, but we want to leave some room at the end for questions. So if you think like five or eight minutes would be enough for you to tie it up? Yes, I will. Um, skip a couple. Um, so Mario Red mentions, uh, I believe, um, the long term vision that came out in September um, that included a vision for um, expanding upon the cloudburst projects, the pilot projects um, that we've been developing in Southeast Queens. Um, so going beyond Southeast Queens and introducing the concept of these hubs, cloudburst hubs. And what that is, is um, where we look at the, the stormwater maps, uh, the flood maps, um, and we see where there are these blue spots around the city. There's a lot of them, um, but we can focus on those areas and see how much water we can capture so that it can reduce the flood depths um, in those locations. Um, and there's a lot of things that we have to consider. I already mentioned these, um, like where to put it um, is, is very difficult sometimes. Um, and in the process of looking how to expand beyond Southeast Queens, we're considering physical vulnerability. So that's the flooding, um, operational, uh, work, work. That's already what I've mentioned where we can put it and, um, who owns the land. Can we work with our existing partners with parks, with, D with department of transportation, um, and who's at risk. Um, I'm going to skip these. Um, so we've been conducting feasibility studies. Um, to look where we can cite these different strategies and it's taking um, a mix of, of the strategies that we have. So um, looking at ways we can uh, change the streets, uh, even using raised crosswalks, which, you know, are used for ADA compliance and traffic calming, but they can also help keep water out of low points. Um, porous pavement, as I mentioned, um, and I'll give a couple of examples of these. Um, 
and we have to consider other criteria when we're also looking to cite these, um, you know, what's what's at risk, how, how can we maximize uh, benefits for the public, because we do have currently a, a limited uh, pool of funding. So um, beyond rain gardens, we have porous pavement. Um, this is a project we have in, in Queens in, in Rigo Park, uh, pretty simple concepts, uh, but we can put drains underneath, which help convey water to storage locations, um, larger median storage, um, where we can take entire um, strips uh, and, and have much larger um, volume captured. Um, I already mentioned the larger um, uh, storage that we are piloting in, in Southeast Queens. And then we're looking beyond, um, this is beyond New York. This is an example from Miami where they've taken over an entire street and can capture, I believe, eight inches of, of rain. Um, and so, you know, there's opportunities um, all around us, but but actually um, making them happen is, is, is not so easy sometimes given, um, you know, what's, what's underground. Uh, and just to wrap up, just so, um, can kind of see what this looks like. Uh, we're exploring um, one uh, possible project um, near uh, in Corona Queens. Um, it's near the near Hall of Science, which flooded severely during Ida, wow. um, and only I think recently opened up um, again. Uh, but these are looking at this entire space and seeing how much can we do. Um, throughout the property, um, not just limiting ourselves to one site, um, can we create these connected spaces that absorb and store water? Um, and this is the schematic um, showing that we'll absorb water in the streets, we'll capture we'll capture it in, in front of the New York Hall of Science, we'll store it um, under the parking lot, um, and all these spaces are connected so that you can actually get water um, into them and uh, if one it becomes full, for instance, the front lawn, um, it then goes to the underground storage um, where it can be stored. And I think I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, this is just an image showing, uh, you know, the bike lanes present an opportunity as well um, to create porous surfaces. So there's really, um, you know, uh, opportunities all around us and, and we're really excited to um, get in. Uh, to this program with the announcement of our initial Cloudburst hubs by the end of this year um, and uh, hope to um, announce more and find more opportunities um, over the coming years. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Certainly hopeful that uh, one of those initial Cloudburst hubs will find its way somewhere near us in Prospect Park. So I'd like to open up for questions. Anybody care to? Glenn, go ahead, fire away. Thank you. Uh, yes, you sort of led into it. Uh, you, you talked an awful lot about uh, projects in Queens, which I'm sure the residents in Queens are very happy about, but I didn't hear any, any hardly anything about what's happening in Brooklyn, um, and more specifically, of course, in our community district. Uh, are there any projects happening nearby? Thank you. Uh, so for this particular um, initiative, uh, we are still looking beyond Southeast Queens to identify um, lo new locations. And so we haven't an announced, uh, we haven't determined what, what locations those will be yet. Um, but there are uh, certainly green infrastructure projects, as, as you pr probably already know, um, th throughout Brooklyn, um, in addition to the ongoing um, sewer work that um, Mario mentioned. Um, so I don't know more if you wanted to say anything um, more. Well, I think at the last uh, the last meeting we we uh, we showed we we've, we've built quite a you know we've built quite a few um, rain gardens in the area. Um, our focus is around Prospect Park, um, and you know I don't want to repeat myself from the last meeting. Meeting, but we did we did have a, a long meeting with Parks. Parks talk, you know, I'm very familiar with the flooding that happens along like Caton Avenue, um, around Coney Island Avenue, you know, particularly East 10th Street, and a little bit out of the district. And um, 
Kermit Place. Um, so um, uh, Parks is finally making like a twenty million dollar investment, probably mostly in in like blue belt type uh, structures to try and detain the water and store the water that normally runs out of the park internally. And we agreed to um, contribute to um, you know similar projects in and around Prospect Park, but the but like what Alan pointed to, uh, you, you know, the park presents opportunities for things like cloudburst to divert water um, and store because it's a giant permeable surface. And probably one of the best spots we can look at that is the parade grounds. It's not in, it doesn't show, you know, that area doesn't show up on the map as, as a bad flooding area on the stormwater map, but we know anecdotally it is, it's undeniable. We've seen the videos. We talked to the residents. So um, I know. I know. Uh, as the cloudburst initiative develops, uh, you know, from our, our end, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, probably uh, pointing to that location, um, um, that area of the district, um, as a potential area for additional GI like cloudburst with uh, Allen's group. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of work. Um, Mark, are you on the line? Mark Greenberg? Yes, Mario, I am. <clears throat> Can you talk about the work we've done in the park? So yearly we meet <clears throat> with park staff and um, survey and inspect all the catch basins in the park and clean whatever we can. I believe last year we uh, cleaned 40 and we're scheduled to do it again shortly. Yeah, so those are the basins inside the park mm -hmm. that, that Parks is actually responsible for. But, you know, we came up to this brick wall where they, between the park and their conservancy, <clears throat> they don't have the resources, hopefully, to, to, to maintain the infrastructure they have. So DP stepped in and we're helping, we help them inspect and, and, and clean their catch basins. They have catch basins, they have sewers. And seepage basins, but we're hoping this investment will improve that. Um, and like I said, keep in mind, um, you know, we have to serve the whole city, so we're trying to balance on one hand um, the, the the mission we have to build sewers where people have none at all, and uh, on the other hand, um, our focus for building new sewers or rebuilding sewers is where you know we have to worry about state of good repair. Um, and, and then secondly, flooding. So, um, um, as new money comes in, you know, we're not leaving any district, um, hopefully from the federal government, we're not leaving any community board district out of that. All right. Thanks. Um, just, I'm sorry, okay? Barton, to jump in, but just before you go on to the next questions, I do want to note that Deborah Kirshner and um, and Alexis McKenzie, Pauline Edwards are here. They're going to be presenting um, on behalf of parks, so they may have more to say about the uh, uh, projects regarding water management in the parks a little later, too. Um, can I move on, Liz, to your last question? Hi. Yeah, um, I think you touched on it a little, and I'm glad to hear that you're also considering areas like Prospect Park that are known to have immense flooding um, to create immense flooding during, um, you know, not just historic storms, but normal storms. Um, and I, I did note on the map that uh, the three maps do that the kind of um, intro to it says that this is um, assuming that, you know, assuming a uniform rainfall and assuming um, that the sewer system is working as it's designed and intended, which um, I think, you know, you, you, as, as you've meant, as you've talked to us before, um, you know, and, and as you're minuting now there, that's, that's a, a very broad, a very big assumption. Um, so I'm just, you know, I, I it's, it's great that you know about um, the area um, around East 10th street and Caton and Coney Island Avenue that, that we've been discussing and, and the way it interacts with parks and, and Glad that there's a lot of work that's going to be going on with that, but like, I just wanted to ask more broadly, like, what else is being done to, you know, this is a great 1st step to, like, have this, like, simple model that kind of makes assumptions that things are in good repair um, for targeting this sort of work. But um, as we've seen that the state of good repair repairs can't quite keep up with what's going on. Um, is there going to be like a later model of the stormwater? Um, you know, for the cloudburst program um, to better incorporate the like current, you know, 
current system, you know, the, the current issues from it. Um, you know, of course, part of that is to help push for forward normal things, but, um, you know, maybe I, I think, you know, I, I think we all expect that the, the current sewer hasn't been designed for the kind of flooding, um, that comes in cloud bursts. Um, so it, it you know, I, I guess just like, is there going to be more data gathered to to make a more accurate picture of, of how this is, because, you know, I look at that section that we're talking about and there's no, it doesn't show up until the 2080 map as nuisance flooding, but I can tell you right now, we have more than nuisance flooding, according to, you know, we get more than four inches regularly running down the street. Yeah. Well, you, your, your area is special because it's, 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 a, it's a mag you're below, um, you're below points where water is exiting the park and, and coming down in big volumes. So, it's more about it's not your that area is more not not so much about um, uh, elevation as location. But again, like I said, we don't just base um, what we do on three one complaints and, and 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 engineering data like elevation. And that's why you know the community board are important partners with us because it was really them that really made us aware of the problems uh, down like around around the blocks around. Uh, you know, Caton and, and Coney Island Avenue. But Alan, can you just speak about, um, like, um, mm -hmm. when we're implementing cloud bursts, um, we don't have to necessarily redo the drainage plan in an area like we do when we have to upgrade the sewer system. Is that right? That, that's right, yeah. And um, regarding, you know, sort of improving our understanding, um, I think, Mario, you al alluded to or men mentioned the, um, flood sensor. So one thing that, you know, happened when we, um, released the maps, first off, we're one of the 1st cities in, in the country to, to do this. Um, so there was really not a lot of, um, information, um, on, in terms of how, how to do this and, and we didn't have great, um, data on actually looking at, uh, how extensive flooding was occurring and, um, and for how long? Um, so we have three on one data, but now in addition to that, we're uh, having we're going to have the benefit of of these sensors that are being deployed across the city um, to help us understand um, is our model you know how well is our our model working and to be able to make um, improvements. So um, you know the the short answer is is yes, we're going to continue to make improvements, and as we um, as we d uh, identify projects um, will be doing more detailed modeling of those areas um, to make sure that the um, projects will actually help reduce the flooding. Thanks. Um, Liz, we'll come back to you for another question in a minute if we could. And then I believe Sophia Francis is the next one up with a question. Go ahead. Hi, yes, I'm Sophia from Cortell U Road. And I just wanna make sure that we put Cortell U Road's name out there simply because we've had a flooding problem in that area. And I'm talking about Cortell, you more so between Coney Island and, you know, like the, the merchants um, strip. Cortell, you took probably about East 16, East 17, but definitely more towards Cortell, you road in Coney Island and Stratford. Growing up, you know, in on um, Cortell, you road from a young person and being um, a child who grew up, you know, living on top of our storefront. I can remember back in the 80s, like our basement would flood all the time. My mom and my dad going down to the basement and then saying, get back up the stairs, kids, you know? And I see business owners there now and I feel for them because everybody, you know, we love Cortell Road, but I know how these basements can look. And because we still have buildings on Cortell Road, we have fixed it to make it work. But some new people and we see them buying and going into, we're like, oh my gosh, you're going to have a problem, you know? but there's a serious problem on Cortell U Road with the catch basins. And what we used to do, you know, growing up there over the decades is as a community, we would clean the catch basins, which you're encouraging us to do. But I just need to help these new business owners. When we go to Corma meetings and I hear their stories, I feel for them because they now they have, what do you call it, walk-in freezers and different things in the basements and a bad rainfall and it's flooded. So I just want to make sure that I say Cortell U Road and that DEP knows Cortell U Road. And if you can please look into Cortell U Road, whatever maps or whatever you're doing, because it's I'm 45 and that's been a situation for 40 odd years. So certainly oh. you and your neighbors should always report to 311. They do. That. Yeah, that's great. 
you not everybody does and the community board we do um mark you got yeah it's cortilla road and where from CIA. Coney Island all the way over to, I would say around E16, E17, like the Merchant Strip. Mary, we, we have this on our list of the five of, of the chronics. And so I, I'll, I'll uh, resend that to you so sure, that we Sean. have it um, higher up in your inbox. And, and another thing I just want to point out quickly is that we used to do uh, catch basin inspections monolithically on a three year cycle inspection and cleaning. In addition, you know, whatever we got from 301 and now what we've done based on analysis is we have um, different cycles for different areas so uh, usually on commercial strips where there's more likely to um uh where, where trash we may accumulate more quickly we make the cycle as short as six months so um you know sean if you send me that mark and i'll go look go back and look at that and see how you know, what kind of cycle is, is Cortilla Road on the right cycle to check the catch basins? Great, thanks. Um, Dwayne, I see you just raised your hand. Go ahead. Sorry to take him out of order, but he has my co-chair and he'll beat me up if I don't. No, no, you can actually, uh, others raise their hands. So, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I just, I'm curious, Mario, um, is there any coordination with parks um, and, and DEP to like do pruning around, especially with where you know, we've got a lot of we don't have a lot of green space but we got a lot of green trees you know uh in our district we have um a lot of trees a lot of them are mature trees um and i'm wondering if there's any coordination between dep and parks to survey and and assess whether or not pruning should be done uh, especially in those areas that are heavily prone to flooding uh, for the cash basins to have less debris um, from the, the falling leaves um Mark, uh, can you speak to that? Mario, currently we do not coordinate with um, parks as far as pruning trees on top of the catch basins. However, we do um, have a list of chronic flooding locations around Prospect Park as one of them. And any time before it rains heavily, we do go out and pre-inspect and clean debris off the catch basins. And we find a lot of the times, especially around Prospect Park, they're inundated with leaves and stuff just covering the grate so the basin won't function. We try and get out before the storm to uh, get them cleaned off. But that's also sanitation's responsibility to sweep the streets. And now that alternate side parking has gone back to two days a week, we have seen an improvement in that. So okay, we thanks. It's, it's, a less. it's always a multi-agency issue in, in such situations. I'd like to go to Eric. Go ahead and read the question. Oh, thank you, and thank you for coming. Um, I had two questions. One was just building off of Sophia, and you guys spoke to it. You know, it does matter to tell the community board, like if residents see things flooding in the park or in on the streets. Uh, I'm just kind of curious if there's particular things like what should be called. Like, for example, if there's flooding again on Cortell, you should it be called into three one one every time? Is there a particular information that's really helpful? Uh, to be shared you guys mentioned video so just if uh if there's something that uh, we should share with our neighbors and uh about uh when and what to report uh and what comes up to you that would be appreciated and my second question was just i'm curious uh, the scale of the issue across the city but our district what how many uh rain or surge events uh a year overwhelm the sewer capacity to where you need those uh, cloudburst management interventions. That, so thank you. Well, with, with 301 complaining, it, even though like something looks like the same thing's happening in the same location, it's good to put in a complaint because one day it could be one thing, like the flooding is street flooding because the basins are clogged on top. The next day, especially on a commercial strip or a strip where you have a lot of uh, big apartment houses, it could be grease in the sewer that's that's causing a backup. So, you know, we don't know until we get there. So that's why, you know, we want to be notified. And especially with something like grease, we'll see if we can, you know, it's not going away. Um, if, if, if it clogged the sewer, usually it's still there after the water dissipates. So, um, you know, we get a lot of it. And, and especially if we're able to talk to complainants, we don't ignore what we say. I... 
I have access to Mark, the, the system that Mark's people use and has fantastic notes about what um, the people who filed the complaint said, not only when they reported it, but when our staff went out to talk to them. So it's worth it to file the complaint. Um, and, and if you see that, it, you know, we try to contact you if we're there at the right hour and then, you know, tell them if you do get to talk to DP staff, you know, give them whatever details you have. Um, in terms of the other question about the, the GI, I'll, you know, hand that to Alan. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's, I don't have it, a number per se, but, um, you know, the types of events that are causing it um, might be, I might be saying the obvious here are often really localized. Um, your uh, su summertime thunderstorms, um, we've had a lot um, that have been like sitting over northern Manhattan, for example, um, and causing severe flooding there. You probably saw the images from the subways. Um, and uh, the, you know, the coastal, I mean, sorry, the tropical events are less common, like we had last year, um, but we seem to be seeing um, more of those and more heavy rain events um, linked to, to tropical storms that are coming up from the Gulf. Um, and then, you know, every winter we have um, nor'easters and, and that where um, if you're near the coast and in particular, um, they have high tides and it's it's harder for the water to drain. Um, so it's pretty frequent um, that, you know, the um, that we have these events that um, that exceed the, the sewer system, but uh, but very localized. I've heard of something called climate change indeed. Um, I'd like to ask, since we do have two other solid presentations, if Joella and Liz, if you could post your questions in the chat, maybe, and see if you can get them answered that way. I will try to be brief, buddy. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, Mario and Alan, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mario, I really appreciate to hear about the ongoing project with parks, but is there any way that you can keep the office of council member? Joseph inform of those ongoing projects because sometimes the constituent are the like call or reach out to us and definitely we reach out to um Denise and Karen and they always provide us with the best assistance. But if there's something going on around Prospect Park, we would appreciate to be informed about them so we can uh, provide them with the best assistance. Yeah, it's right. Not uh, necessarily I'll... a matter for the committee if you guys want to uh, connect on that offline. Yeah, well, well, like I, I, I won't speak about the parks project, but our stuff, the stuff we're working on in conjunction with parks is pretty new. But, but um, once more data, I mean, once more details come forth about what it's going to look like, we'll be happy to meet with the council office and the community board to talk about that. Thanks Thank you so sir. much. As, as you. always, thanks again for all of the information you offer and your forthright answers. So. Uh, I'd like to, if we could move on to the Nat Grid presentation, which um, pertains to the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, and I gather we have Razik Seabrook from National Grid explaining how Nat Grid is going to try to balance both the requirements of the act and the needs of the constituency regarding rates and obligations. So, Razik, are you ready to go? I am. However, I would just like to pose this to you all as a question. I have a personal event that I've been outside of for about an hour or so now. And so the presentation lasts about, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes. And I have to be in this place at about eight o'clock. I don't think that leaves much time for Q and A. So my question to you all, would you like me to present now and defer a question to a later date or would it be better if I just did a whole cumulative presentation um, sometime at a, in the future? My my gut would be just go ahead and do the presentation, and then if you don't have time for the questions, we can either take them in the chat and forward them along to you, and you can convey back answers to us, and we can distribute them. Um. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just go fire away. Yeah. So apologies again. I know I tend to talk fast anyway. Can you all see on my screen here? Yeah. Yeah. Looking good. Um. Wonderful. Um. Thank you all for your time. Um, again, this is a, a condensed version of a much larger presentation. If you all would like me to come back. I'm more than happy to do so. Um, if you remember nothing else from what I say here tonight, um, there are about four to five things that, well, five things I would like you all to, to take away from this. Um, first and foremost, um, 
of what I say here, uh, unfortunately, um, because we're a utility provider, um, the this has been seen by certain individuals and they say things like, well, it seems that you're really anti-CLCPA in the draft scoping plan. And I want to ensure you that overtly, in fact, we are not. Um, about 90% of the plan as is, we completely agree with. Um, we just have uh, four issues, if you will, with the plan as, a, as it relates to us being utility provider and us talking to communities and customers every day, uh, as in rate payers. Um, and the four major concerns that we have are, um, first is methodology, right? The CLCPA basically says what we have to do, not necessarily how we have to do it, right? And so within that process, we just believe that there's some considerations that should be made as it relates to the use of certain technologies um, relating to being able to differentiate what CLCPA and what CAC looks like distinct from upstate to downstate in terms of what feasibility looks, how what, feasibil what feasibly is possible, excuse me. Um, and so from a methodology perspective, we believe that the plan as, it's, as it is currently is a bit too rigid. And we just believe that there are certain technologies that the plan as written, unfortunately, doesn't adequately um, contemplate usage of. Second component is feasibility, right? As I noted earlier, um, upstate versus downstate looks very different. Um, and when you think about what New York City looks like in terms of an infrastructure perspective, you have a myriad of issues up to and including density, zoning issues, um, uh, land use changes and things of that nature um, that that run up against the timeline and some of the deadlines as presented by the CLC PA, rather the draft scoping plan. Um, and so we just believe that from a, a feasibility perspective, uh, while very laudable and with a lot of the goals that we agree with, we just believe that as we get from point A to point B, there are some considerations that need to be more adequately taken into account. Um, same thing goes for reliability. Um, to the extent that we need to keep the lights on, um, particularly on the coldest days of the winter, um, we believe that there's some concerns as it relates to using full electrification exclusively, um, because again, to the extent that we need to have a reliable, redundant grid, um, that this is a concern in that regard. And also to the extent that there's a lack of energy, um, it becomes an equity issue because we know that brownouts disproportionately happen in black and brown and low and moderate income neighborhoods. Um, and lastly, um, affordability, that kind of buttresses with that point, right? To, um, currently, as it stands, the CLCPA doesn't break down the cost of the plan down to the customer level. So if I was an employer, if I'm a homeowner, if I'm a renter, the plan as is, I would not be able to discern how much um, this would cost me, um, even within a ballpark, within a reasonable range, right? And so we just believe that to the extent that most people just care that lights come on and care how much you know it costs them to you know generate energy to cook and heat their homes and things of that nature we just believe that the plan uh, falls a bit short in that it's just insufficient in giving folks that information and so again if you take nothing else from you know my ramblings here tonight um just those pretty much those four points right methodology we just believe that the plan is a bit too prescriptive and doesn't incorporate some of the technologies that are being used and a lot of the places being loaded by um the individuals on the climate action council um, to feasibility, right? When we think about what New York State looks like, New Buffalo is much different than Brooklyn, and so we, and to the extent that we have a plan that is going to be statewide, it should be cog, it should be, uh, it should adequately contemplate, excuse me, the regional and local differences within throughout the state and even within individual boroughs. Um, same thing goes for reliability to the extent that the plan predominantly advocates for the use of electrification, which again, we are not opposed to. Um, we just believe that um, as it relates to ensuring that we are able to deliver energy safely and reliably to customers um, throughout the year, particularly on the coldest days of the year, um, we just have some concerns about the capacity of the grid to do that as the plan is contemplated. And then lastly, again, affordability to the extent that there is no adequate contemplation of how much this plan will cost individuals. Um, we just believe that that is something that should be materially um, contemplated and then uh, adjustments should be made. Um, so with that being said, um, there are a number of slides here. I won't go into detail with every slide. Um, and I will try to leave as much time as possible for questions on the back end. Thanks, go ahead. Absolutely. So this is first is just a high level what the CLCPA is um, and what is contemplated in terms of um, the goals. And so basically it's fundamentally it's a attempt to reduce greenhouse gas emissions relative to levels that were uh, measured in 1990. Um, this slide is some of the specifics of the scoping plan. Um, and again, all of the concerns that I raised here tonight will speak to one of those four pillars that I noted previously. So here, um, one of the issues, one of the concerns that we have 
is um, if you look at where it says no new harmful bans, um, no new gas bans after 2024. Excuse me, no new gas in existing buildings after 2024, so the end of within you know next year or so. Um, no new gas in newly constructed buildings at the same date. And then this third bullet here is actually incorrect, but I intentionally left it as such. Um, it says no new gas appliances for home heating, cooking, water heating, clothes drying beginning in 2030. Um, that was the excuse me, that was the previous standard. That date has now been pushed to 2035. Um, and the reason I left it as such is just to show that, you know, some of these numbers, while they're goals, right, a lot of the CLCPA is about goals and, you know, having, um, making a declaration of values. But at the end of the day, to the extent that we're dealing, we are, you know, National British Utility Company and we deal with customers every day. So while, you know, the governor and the government has outlined these goals, we have some concerns relative to some of these dates being relatively arbitrary. Um, and I think this is a perfect example of where government has you know in the within the law has decided that there this is the goal however when you start to break down the numbers and the metrics um some of these things need to get pushed back and so that just speaks to some of the feasibility concerns as it relates to some of the things that they're attempting to do relative to the reality on the ground about how fast a lot of these um actual changes can happen here is just the uh full list of all of the things that we uh, like within the plan so we approve we we like that there's lower emissions we like that there's expanded energy efficiency which is you know about 50 percent of national grids plan to get from point a to point b we we enjoy the use of electrification um we like that the plan adequately contemplates the use of technologies like green hydrogen um and renewable natural gas and so these are all the things in which that we we explicitly agree with and we learned about the plan here are some of the things that we have, we, we see as pain points. And again, all of these pain points can fit in one of those four categories of methodology, feasibility, reliability, or affordability. And so if you look at the, the third bullet down, it says no insurance of ongoing reliability. Um, that is published, that was a, that comes from a report published by the NISO. NISO stands for the New York Independent Systems Operators. Um, they're an apolitical nonpartisan body that's responsible for maintaining the electric grid and ensuring that New York State has enough energy and enough um, capacity to ensure that individuals have energy within their homes, particularly on the coldest days of the winter. Um, and we only point that out because, again, understanding that the perceived bias of us as utility pointing out their reliability concerns, um, I, we left that bullet in explicitly to this point that there are independent bodies responsible for monitoring these things. And they also have um, reliability concerns about what this looks like. Um, and then if you also look at the last, the second to last bullet that says no plan to fully achieve the unprecedented level of new renewable energy generation that is required during the next eight years. Really at this point, it's about seven years. Um, to date, since the New York State has been begun to develop renewable energy, we have developed about 26%. So right now, all you look at all of New York State energy, particularly since um, Indian Point was offline, uh, we get about 26% of our energy from renewable sources. The plan, draft scope of plan currently contemplates that 70% of our energy will come from renewable sources by 2030. Um, again, which is again, a very laudable plan, but effectively we're saying that within the next seven years, we will triple approximately the amount of energy that we output from renewable sources, which again is a laudable goal. But when you think about from to date, right, you know, 10, 20, 30 years that we've been trying to develop some of these technologies, we've only got to 26%. So it is probably not feasible or, you know, practical to say that within the next seven years, um, we're going to effectively triple that amount. Again, we're not opposed to it, but to the extent that we have to deal with, deal with things like zoning um, uh, and things like that, particularly as it relates to getting upstate energy to downstate, though some we have a, a feasibility concern um, in that regard. Um, these are our comments that we made to the plan, but again, these are just condensed versions of some of the things that I'm outlining to you right now. Um, and here we have just some specific line items as it relates to um, some of the concerns we have. So again, um, the plan, the issue that we have is that the plan doesn't do a full assessment of affordability or practicality, particularly as it relates to some of the technologies that are slated to be used. And so when you think about an individual homeowner, one of the things that are being contemplated with the plan are the use of heat pumps. Heat pumps is a great technology. However, if your home is not currently um, have the infrastructure for a heat pump, the installation of a heat pump can run you tens of thousands of dollars. And so to the extent that something becomes 
in unaffordable, it, it is also then impractical in terms of a solution. Um, and so the next few slides are just ways in which we outline some of the more specific line items within the plan um, and then some of our comments that we've made in response to some of the issues that we've highlighted. Um, same thing for customer choice. Again, this goes to uh, speaks to feasibility and practicality. Because again, if your house is not, at, is not, I have the infrastructure and you don't have the money to pay for those retro. Um, allowing for new technologies and innovations. So this more so speaks to uh, methodology, right? Within the draft scoping plan, it doesn't necessarily uh, account for. Um, the use of technology such as green hydrogen and renewable natural gas. Green hydrogen is basically taking wind and solar um, energy, storing it in hydrogen cells, and then for a later date, because as we all know, the sun doesn't shine at the same rate and the wind doesn't blow at the same rate every day. Um, the same thing for renewable natural gas. Renewable natural gas is taking things like compost, wastewater, things that already emit um, greenhouse gases within the air, taking that offline, processing it, and then being able to use it as a clean burning fuel. Um, and so we just believe that technology such as this should be contemplated within the global plan, draft scoping plan, because again, to the extent that um, a lot of the advocates who are um, in championing, championing the plan, a lot of the locations that they champion around the world um, up to and including places like Switzerland, which is, you know, in many ways seen as one of the green capitals of the world. These are technologies that are being used in locations such as that. We just believe that those kind of technologies should be more adequately used in um, the draft scoping plan within the state of New York. Significant focus on energy, um, energy efficiency. We just believe, again, within the methodology component, the, the perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good. And so to the extent that people have, for instance, you know, older boilers that are decades old, if there are incentives for them to bring in new, more efficient technologies, we don't believe that those things should be offline because again, to the extent that this is about overall emissions reductions, for some individuals, it will be a phased approach while other folks can go green immediately. Um, so again, we just believe that here, um, the perfect, again, shouldn't be the enemy of the good. Accounting for emissions. This is a more technical component of it, but this just basically speaks to the idea of if we're using things like renewable natural gas, certainly any emissions from burning that as energy should be accounted. But in addition to that accounting, it should also be taken into account um, the emissions that will not happen because that those um, biofeed and those feedstocks aren't just sitting at a landfill emitting into the atmosphere. So we just believe that's a technical issue that has been mostly resolved. But again, this is more of a methodology question um, that we have. And lastly, we have the electrification of transport. And so to the extent that this kind of speaks to many of the issues, probably all four of the pillars, right? Methodology, feasibility, affordability, um, particularly as it relates to New York City, right? We think that we need to, we're not that we think that, we need to ensure that a lot of the incentives and a lot of the subsidies that are going towards a lot of these transition, uh, macro transition components need to be more coordinated, particularly when it comes to low to moderate income individuals. A lot of these programs are rebate programs, but however, for, for it to be a rebate program, and for that program to be effective, you need to have the upfront capital to, um, to do the actual build outs and then you can get you know um the rebates on the back end but if you don't have the money on the front end then that program is moot to you because again it is impractical um so we just believe that things like that need to be taken into account and any barriers to you know charging fueling infrastructure and things of that nature should be adequately addressed um because to the extent that we have a space issue and we have a resource issue it then becomes an equity issue so here is just a, a lastly, I would just say here, um, we just have a, um, the joint utility site is just a resource that where the, um, all of the utility companies from throughout the state have basically combed through the plan and gave some comments relative to where they sit. Um, National Grid Downstate is a electric, uh, excuse me, is a gas company. So we, National Grid serves all of Brooklyn say about half of Queens and all of Staten Island. Upstate, we are both gas and electric. As you know, you also have Con Edison and a myriad of other PSEG utility companies. And so this is just an amalgamation of all of these, of all of the companies basically giving commentary relative to what we do and where we do it. Um, and so we just think that's a great resource. And then Sean has this um, presentation. So you all are welcome to uh, view these resources at your leisure. This is how you submit recent written testimony. Um, the plan will be voted on on July, excuse me, on December 19th. 
which is kind of like uh, an inflection point. After that, it will go to the regulatory process. Um, and so as of right now, the best way to um, get in contact with folks will be this email that I just highlighted, scopingfan at nyserta.ny.gov. Um, in addition to being able to reach out to your le your legislatures and your local elected officials who also, you know, have uh, a pulse on this as well. Um, and then this last slide is about our core messages, and I'll save you guys the, the aspect of this, but I will just say that um, we also, in addition to this, what National Grid has done, we have something called our fossil free vision. Um, and that vision basically has four pillars by which we are achieving the CLCPA. Um, we were asked a question, um, which I was actually really proud of our answer. We were asked a question um, maybe about two to three weeks before um, the general election. And where, you know, you, I'm, all, I'm sure you all saw, you know, the, the news and the papers about the, the race becoming tighter and tighter for the governor. And someone asked us, well, if the administration's flips and you have some and we have more conservative leadership within the executive, are you all going to still implement your plan to comply with the CLCPA? And our president, as well as our vice president, both said unequivocally yes. And so I was just very encouraged by that because, again, it shows that National Grid is not only making a commitment to this because we're required to do it. It's, they're also showing that we're doing because they truly believe in the things that we're doing as it relates to addressing the impacts of climate change. Um, and I would just say the four pillars of that plan are energy efficiency which is included in the plan. So basically 50% of the way in which we intend to reach the goals of the CLCPA is just by making buildings more efficient as it relates to emissions. Um, the second is targeted electrification and geothermal, right? Using geothermal, which is a relatively new technology and we're working on pilots right now in the city. Also electrifying buildings where it's feasible and where it's practical. Um, we've done studies to show that about 70% of New York City building stock is either extremely hard or impossible to electrify. And so to the extent that we're talking about, you know, about a, a smaller subsect of buildings, these are places where we think that electrification will be practical, which is where we're ready, willing, and able to implement. Hybrid systems. So hybrid systems are using more traditional e energy sources um, in places like Buffalo, for instance, to keep, to get a home up to temperature and then using renewable energy sources to maintain those levels of energy. Um, Cause a heat pump work functions much differently in a place like Buffalo when they have six feet of snow than in Park Slope where, you know, we might get a little snow and it gets a little cold, but uh, you know, we don't necessarily have to deal with those extreme uh, winter um, incidents. Um, and then lastly, as I discussed, you know, the use of renewable natural gas and green hydrogen. As of right now, the, the draft scoping plan contemplates those things to be used from a commercial setting. Um, however, when it comes to heating homes and cooking gas for residential uses, um, the plan falls short in that regard. And we just believe, again, from a feasibility, affordability uh, methodology perspective, right, we are still adhering to the goals and to the letter of the law. However, we think that to the extent that there are individuals who don't have enough, um, who don't have adequate amounts of resources to do the transition immediately, there needs to be options for those individuals who can become better situated um, relative to their, their capacities to be you know, less emitting. And so to the extent that we can transition folks to electrification through technologies like green hydrogen and renewable natural gas, we believe that again, here is another example where the perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good. Um, so with that, I will stop. Um, I apologies. I know I spoke pretty fast during that presentation. Um, if you all have any questions, uh, please let me know. I am ready, willing, and um, able to answer um, whatever you all may want to ask. You're, you're on mute, Barton. You did, Barton. Right. I was just thanking you. Um, you did speed through it. It's appreciated. Dwayne, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, I do. Uh, thank you for this presentation, Bart, uh, Razik. Um, if you could just quickly jump back, I think it's slide number three or four where you spoke about the... I'm sorry. I thought that the questions were going to go through the community board so you could move on to the next presenters. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll defer. But... This, this is just a, just a quick one, John. Um, uh, go back to your no slide, Razik. I think it's one back. No, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that twenty six percent you said is current um, renewable energy that's been generated since the closure of Indian Point, uh, and that that's the been developed today, even even today. So it was it was that number was higher when it, mm -hmm. when Indian Point was online, but when they offlined it, 
um, that's the number that we have about today. Okay, so it's been reduced. Correct. When okay. Indian Point was offline, it provided about anywhere between 25 and 30 percent of clean energy to New York City at the time. Okay, I just want a clarification on that. Thank you. Yeah. What again, following up on Sean's side, and anybody else on the call who does have questions, either put them in the chat, submit them to the community board office. I do have a quick comment. I do see it a bit of a problem again that the uh, the consumer does not really seem protected in all of this that if the onus of fulfilling the act's requirements falls on that grid and that grid is then able to pass along say 100 percent of the extra cost requirements onto the consumers that that would certainly be an issue for me um, i don't know you know ultimately how that will play out but i think i just you know want to put that forward at this point and um, the other thing is i I'd like a sense of maybe if we could get someone to speak on behalf of the CLCPA at some point to give us the perspective on how they came to their conclusions, and especially the ones that uh, NatGrid is taking exception to. So that's something I think we'll take up with, uh, you know, Dwayne and Sean and maybe the relative agency. So absolutely, again, I would, let me just speak to the first part, Barton, and further. And I think you hit the nail on the head, right? I think one of the challenges for National Grid. I know I've been there for about eight months, and when I got here, you know, it's a bunch of you know c customers hate us, and we have these you know strained relationships. And one of the things I told them is that you know, as utility companies, a lot of the things that we do are mandated or prescribed by government agencies and bodies, and it, it is only when we have to go out to the customers to do the thing. Do people even understand why something is happening, right? And so one of the things that I overtly advocated for was the ability to come out and have this conversation with you all, because like you said, these things are mandated by the state, but the state doesn't charge customers, right? No one's gonna go back and say, hey, this council that was appointed by government mandated National Grid to do this thing that is raising my bill. They just know National Grid is raising my bill. And so I think that why, while it is again laudable and we are very much you know it, it, we are very much in support of and advocating for action to be taken globally on the state level to combat climate change we do believe that affordability is preeminent in terms of ensuring that everybody can transition justly because unfortunately one of the things that reality is will happen is if the plan is implemented as is we will have a lot of the folks that were left out traditionally for a myriad of things will also be left out here and to the extent that the solutions require you know things like subsidy programs or heat pumps or things like that which one require you to have money and then two also require you to have autonomy over your space right because nowhere in this plan is it adequately accounting for folks who are renters who don't necessarily have the the jurisdiction to change things within their living space um, that becomes a problem as well. So I think you hit the nail right on the head. And I think that to the extent that we can have those conversations coming from anecdotally and both holistically from individuals, I think that will be effective messaging um, to get the state to, to the act. Great. Thanks, Razik. I really appreciate it. Uh, good luck making your, <laughs> your appointment at this Absolutely. point. Um, so I will speed on to the update on the Prospect Park operations and activities. Uh, Deborah, are you there? I am here. I was just turning off my <laughs> mute. Hi, Barton. It's good, good to, to see, see you, you again. Yes. Yes. Nice to see you all. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm Deborah Kirshner. I'm actually with Prospect Park Alliance, um, the nonprofit organization that operates the park in partnership with the city. I have with me my colleague Alexis McKenzie, um, who is our community relations coordinator. Alexis McKenzie, if you want to say hello. Hi, Alexis. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Good evening. Thanks. Thank you. And I am um, the vice president for um, communications and external relations and um, reaching out. We'd like to come once a year just to update you on park activities. I was glad to be here tonight because uh, and to see the presentation by the DEP and I can definitely talk briefly about where we are with our restoration work um, at the lake. Um, but is That'll it okay Martin, if I share my screen? I, I put together a brief presentation that I can. Absolutely. Sean, does she have the privilege? Looks like I do. Um, okay. In the interim, I'll point out that I believe you are having fireworks again on New Year's Eve. Yes, um, borough, the borough, Brooklyn Borough President is funding New Year's Eve fireworks. So he's carrying on the tradition that 
I think began with Marty Markowitz, but maybe even preceded Marty Markowitz, but 40 year tradition um, that Eric Adams also supported and um, Antonio Renoso was excited to be a part of it again. So yes, we're gonna have New Year's Eve fireworks. We're gonna precede it by um, live entertainment at Grand Army Plaza. And um, we hope that the community come out. Um, feel free to share on your communications. We can always provide you with more information. Um, but thank you again for having us here this evening. Um, we'll give you a brief update on activities that have been happening in the park over the past year, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I know you've had a long evening, so I'll try to go quickly. Um, and um, yeah, I'll get going. It's okay. You're entitled to your time. Yeah. So one thing I would say, um, you know, the pandemic is still with us in many ways. Um, during the pandemic, as many of you know, the park became um, our community's everything. Um, we saw incredibly high visitation to the park and that's that was a growing trend that somewhat spiked over the past decade as Brooklyn has grown so has um, visitation to the park and dur definitely during the pandemic we saw a big spike um, people coming to the park using it for all different purposes and reasons and we still see that um, that hasn't really gone away um, Prasa Park Alliance, so we're the, uh, we are the private nonprofit organization that partners with the NYC Parks to operate Prospect Park. Um, we like to say our focus is on the green and blue in the park, where the Parks Department really takes the lead with the gray. And what that means is that a lot of our work is around horticulture, um, caring for the parks, um, 250 acres of woodlands, it's 30,000 trees, our 60-acre lake is very, as many of you know very well, um, we offer... Um, volunteer programs, education programs. We operate the recreational amenities in the park. Um, we have an in-house office of design and construction that does restoration work in the park. Um, we also have horticulturalists and turf specialists that maintain the park's green spaces. Um, one of the things that came out of the pandemic from the past year um, was a new initiative of the Alliance called Renew Prospect Park. Um, one of the nice things that we saw during the pandemic was a real spike in um, people giving back to the park, both um, financially, but also um, and through volunteering. And we really wanted to put that funding back to work to restore the park, given its heavy use. Um, so one thing we did is, um, as I mentioned, the I said the parks department takes the lead in the gray areas, which doesn't sound very fun, but it, they're, 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 they're responsible for basic maintenance um, of the park, both like facilities maintenance, but also trash management. Um, so the Alliance does try to supplement that as we can. Um, we did see, as you all probably know, a really big spike in litter during the pandemic, which was caused by the spike in use of the park. Um, so for the past several years, we've been partnering with um, a nonprofit called ACE New York. Um, which um, finds employment for um, formerly homeless individuals. And we've been um, offering an additional crew um, to, to help with trash management um, on weekends and peak weekdays. It actually started in April and it went through October. Um, the Alliance has also funded larger trash receptacles throughout the park. And we've been doing a lot of promotional campaigns to encourage people to carry in and carry out their trash. Um, we also invested back in the park in, tour, in terms of small capital improvements. Um, this includes everything from um, putting in new picnic tables and barbecues and barbecue areas. In fact, just um, today, we are um, renovating the Wellhouse picnic area, which is just, um, it's along Wellhouse Drive and the, um, and the lake. Um, so we're putting in brand new picnic tables. Last year, we put in new barbecue grills. Um, and we're also working on drainage. So as the DEP mentioned to you, um, there are a lot of issues around catch basins in the park. The park's drainage system is over 150 years old. Um, whenever the Alliance does a capital improvement, we always work on improving the drainage in the areas where we are doing the capital improvements. Uh, but we also depend on the parks department and also DEP to help us with maintaining those um, catch basins. Um, and to keep, to kind of supplement those efforts, the Alliance did invest in um, bringing in crews that could do um, drainage repairs in the park and also um, repairing pedestrian paths and some of the historic structures. Um, and one nice thing we did last year is we um, restored all the benches. We put in new um, rustic benches at the Drummer's Grove to replace ones that had become worn after many years. 
Um, and then volunteering, um, we really leveraged the volunteer support that came in the park and um, started offering green and go kits um, where people can come and help with trash management on weekends. Um, we have a renew volunteer core that goes out once a week in the during our season and they do everything from painting benches um, to replenishing sand and in, in uh, sandboxes and playgrounds and doing all sorts of great work. So these are all things that we have done to um, kind of reinvest in the park following the pandemic and all of that significant usage. Um, another thing we rolled out this year is really, again, trying to address the increased usage of the park by really educating park visitors on um, being better stewards of the park, um, you know, at, kind of raising awareness amongst um, the public on what their role is in terms of, you know, depositing litter in trash cans, um, taking care of the parks and natural areas by staying on paths, keeping their dogs leashed. So we really did this in a really positive way. As you can say, we, we see we created a mascot, a little chipmunk that we named uh, Thelonious Chipmunk, um, and tried to make it a fun, engaging campaign to um, encourage people to give back to the park by being good stewards of the park and doing it in a motivational and a positive way. And with the pledge for people who filled out the pledge, they were entered into a raffle to win a membership to the Alliance. So other highlights of the year, um, we had um, another successful year of our, our Woodlands Youth Crew. That's our signature youth program, youth employment program. We um, hire a crew of high school students. We teach them about ecological restoration. Um, they work in teams. They learn about teamwork, collaboration. They work outside in the park. They help to build rustic trails. Um, both this year and last year, they actually created new rustic trails in our woodlands that enabled the public to get new views and new experiences and enjoying the woodlands in the park. Um, we've had a significantly successful commemorative tree program um, where people give money to plant trees in the park. A lot of times, um, groups of people, individuals come together to put money together to plant a tree in the park, and that has been um, a very big success for us. We also do two major planting um, seasons a year. Where we're planting, um, you know, 500 uh, trees, plants, and shrubs um, throughout the park and supplementing um, its, its the woodlands. Um, capital improvements, that's something that everybody's really interested in. Um, a lot going on right now um, at the northeast corner of the park. We're in the midst of the design of um, a significant restoration um, in an area that, that's called the Vale. Um, through um, funding from former Mayor de Blasio, um, in addition to restoring the Rand Army Plaza Arch um, Plaza and their surrounding berms. Um, the berms are actually, the, the restoration is well underway and we're about to start work on the plaza um, and the arch will go under restoration in the spring. Um, Leopard's Historic House, um, which is the Historic House Museum in the park, um, over the past year and a half, um, we've been restoring that historic structure It'll be reopening in the spring and um, in exciting news, we got significant funding to actually rethink the um, mission, vision and programming of the Leopards Historic House to really recognize its role as a site of slavery um, and to really raise up and um, elevate the stories of both enslaved Africans, but also indigenous communities um, who um, lived and worked the land. So that work is underway and we are about to reopen in the spring the last of uh, of the seven long meadow ball fields to be restored um, which has been going on for over a decade um, so those fields um, the construction is pretty much completed the the, the lawn is being reseeded and it will open for play um, in the spring um, i do i do realize i apologize i don't have pretty pictures here for this, but um, I did also want to update you on other projects that I know of interest to your community, um, given your um, where you are in the park. Um, we have um, work is well underway and has gone into procurement, which is the phase where we put things out to bid for restoring um, the Ocean Avenue perimeter, a portion of the Parkside Avenue perimeter and the Parkside and Ocean Avenue entrance of the park. Um, that's going to include the construction of a monument to Shirley Chisholm, which many of you know. Um, that project is being led by the Department of Cultural Affairs. It had a, it had a, a fairly significant delay during the pandemic. Um, once the Department of Cultural Affairs was able to 
kind of unfreeze funding and get the project moving again. The artists are very well regarded artists who have a lot on their plate. So there was a little bit of waiting for the timing for the artists to have the bandwidth to get back on board. But the artists are fully committed to the project now. They're um, hard at work at um, creating a design for the monument. And the Department of Cultural Affairs has um, communicated that it should be going through the public design process in the coming months. Um, in addition to that, um, as um, our colleagues at the DEP mentioned, I think I actually have a little bit of information here. Um, we did um, advocate this past year for funding to restore the lake shore um, just south of Lakeside, where we had done the restoration back in 2010, all the way around to the well house. And that's a $20 million project. Um, in the, we, we advocate with the city for funding for prospect park projects. As you know, the parks department doesn't have a capital budget. Um, so we were able to raise, um, 2 million in funding from the city council, which was matched by 1 million in funding from the mayor's office. So we have 3 million in funding, which we're using to create both a master plan for the entire restoration of the lake shore, as well as to implement 1 phase of the project. And that project will be looking at environmental resiliency. Um, as with our drainage system, the lake is also 150 years old and has a lot of degradation um, of its shoreline, which has led to flooding. Um, but it's also looking at um, ADA accessibility to make the, the user experience better along the lake for people to be able to more easily navigate and enjoy the lake shore. Um, and then we're also looking at wildlife habitat and how to strengthen and protect um, habitat for aquatic birds and other wildlife. Um, I think, you know, there are definitely conversations ongoing between the DEP and the Parks Department and the Alliance and how all three can work together. Um, I would not say that the restoration of the lakeshore once we get that 20 million is gonna solve all the issues. And I think it's really important for the DEP and parks to step up and to look more holistically at that entire corner. Um, uh, not just the park, but the bordering streets and how um, different interventions can be implemented to help that. Um, I think one of the things just to add when it comes to flooding, so I know that was really important um, to your community members. Um, we did get funding from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection to um, install new types of valves in our water system. That's going to enable us to better control the flow of water in the water system, as well as um, ensure that what is flowing out of the water system has um, it, it is of good quality. So I'm not explaining it as best I can, but there are steps being taken right now um, that's in procurement should be going into construction shortly. That will also help to improve um, what happens in the park in terms of water flow. Um, Quickly, since we're on this slide, thanks to council member Rita Joseph, um, she provided funding to restore the pergola at the parkside entrance, which is sort of like the one missing piece of the puzzle um, of the restoration of that entrance. Um, we have also received funding in the past year to do a safety study, the park drive, and that's actually come to its conclusion. We're at the final phases of getting the parks department and the DOT's input in that before we release it publicly. Um, and we were able to get some nice participatory budgeting funding um, from council member Rita Joseph and also council member Shahana Hanif to do some restoration of pathways and lighting in the Prospect Park um, ravine, which is the woodlands in the center of the park. So lots of capital improvements going on in the park right now. Lots of great projects um, coming up um, just for you to all know. We do keep a capital projects tracker on our website at um, prospectpark.org. Um, it's on our homepage and you can always see the full breadth of projects that are happening in the park and, um, their status and, and where they are. And one other project I forgot to mention, and I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of all of these in this presentation is another, um, popular, um, participatory budgeting process project was the, uh, parade ground fit, which was a second sort of adult recreation area in the parade ground, um, that, um, broke ground in the spring and it's actually gone at a very good clip. Um, and in fact, I just learned today that the, um, the main part of that area will be opening to the public as early as tomorrow. Um, the work is fairly done. We're, there's still some landscaping that needs to be done in that area um, that is ongoing. Um, and that there's also some state of good repair path improvements happening 
um, in the surrounding area. Um, so that work is ongoing as well, but um, the, the Prairie Ground Fit project is, has been highly successful and, and the construction is coming to its conclusion. So that was me talking quickly to um, share with you sort of the key things that have happened in the park over the past year. I'm happy to stop sharing my screen and answer any questions anyone has, provide more clarity over any of the projects or initiatives I just mentioned. I'm so happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Deborah. Um, I would point out that indeed your capital projects tracking page is quite detailed and very straightforward. So for people who want to get a better sense of where these various improvements are in their lifespan, uh, you can just take a very quick look at that and uh, come away with a really strong sense of where we are for the different projects. Um, also separately, uh, as some of you may or may not know, Community Board 14 has a seat on the Prospect Park Community Committee, um, and they are, are seemingly well known for being very community facing making information available and quickly and thoroughly so if any of you do have questions other than questions we may receive now um, i'm sure if you refer them to deborah or to alexis that you would get uh, solid answers quite quickly so with that are there questions for them this evening Think we're all feeling a little glassy eyed after all the information that we've <laughs> I know, had tonight. so many like interesting presentations this evening. Well, 1 thing I'd say to you all is like, you have a gem in uh, Sean. She's a wonderful um, administrator for all of you. And we really have a very strong relationship with her. So I definitely would say um, if anyone has any questions or concerns or. Or anything they want to raise, let us know. I will say with the lake shore, and I feel like I see some familiar faces here. We are doing some public engagement around lake shore. One of the reasons that we were able to get the funding we did for lake shore was through community support. We encourage people to submit letters of support. We created a really easy form on our website for people to fill in, and we got 1,100 letters of support, and that really brought attention to the project from all of our local council members um, and the mayor's office. So it was really helpful. Um, and um, so we had a public meeting um, before the Thanksgiving holiday at Lakeside um, to get community feedback. And um, we have a little bit of a juggling of projects happening right now, but we're hoping to do an online um, public meeting in February um, to to engage a broader audience. Um, and so we will keep um, all of you apprised of that. Um, and I will say that the um, community, the Garden and, and the parks committee representation will also be invited to our community committee will be reviewing plans for the Vale, which is the larger project we're doing in the northeast corner of the park and that should be happening in January. So, Sean and Barden, um, and, um, your other co chair Dwayne should get an invitation to that to join us for that evening. Thanks. Um, I think the roadway safety study sounds interesting and perhaps if you could touch base, Steve Cohen was on here earlier. But uh, maybe just touch base with him with when the results of that finally come through and what uh, DOT and parks have to say about that. Yeah, DOT has made it really clear to us because a lot of our studies around design interventions to make the drive safer and they feel very strongly um, of having a mechanism to get public feedback on it. They want to see what the community thinks of these ideas before anything is implemented. So um, one of the things we're working through right now is um, the best sort of interface for um, getting public um, feedback on, on, the, on the design ideas. Um, and the other good news we learned is that the DOT is planning to repave the entire East Drive um, this spring, which is pretty significant. It's in pretty, pretty deteriorated state. So we're really excited about that and we're working right now with them just to kind of finalize the timing on that. Um, I don't see any other questions. I'll just throw in one last one. Is there anything that you have on your own wish list? that for some reason uh, you know you all have really wanted to do but for some reason just the stars have not aligned yeah that's such a good question i think our strategy is really we have some big projects on our plate right now that we want to see through we're really focused on lake shore it's a significant project 20 million dollars really trying to keep our electeds focused on helping us um, see that project through um, i think we definitely work closely with the parks department um, to see how we can um, get access to state of good repair funds um, 
and also working with each of our council members to see what is on their plate and what's on there. I will say, I will say this, not just because Joelle is on this call, although I see Joelle's on this call, but Rita has been a significant supporter of the park. She really came through in this last fiscal year in funding improvements, not just through PB, but also through her own discretionary funding, um, including improvements at the parade ground. Um, we got the remaining funding we needed to restore I think it's field nine, which is one of the turf fields. I do think the parade ground is a big um, conversation point. It, it is in significant need of restoration. It's a very, very, very heavily used athletic um, complex. And it was restored by the Alliance a number of years ago, very successfully, but given the heavy use and time, like it's really in need of significant funding. Um, so that might be something CB14 wants to think about. Um, the Alliance is involved in advocate, advocacy and design for the parade ground, but um, the Parks Department plays a significant role in its operation. Um, so it's, it's a bigger conversation, um, but something that, you know, can be on all of our radars as well. So. Thank you. Um, Sean, you have a question. Go ahead. I just want to say nice things back at you, Deborah. You know, you always handle like you're just like such a amazing juggling act with such grace all the time. Um, and then wanted to also thank you for the connections that you make between the community board and other stakeholders that that pass through your your gaze. Um, had a good good talk today with the Parkside Plaza people. So um, thank you for making those connections and for all of your hard work. And I just wanted to add the we've been talking about capital and the and the and the and the um, you know the the actual physical environment, but you've also been putting a lot of work into and, and doing a good job. So I want to make a plug for everything you've been doing to gather more volunteerism and with you with your committees and the um, ComCon and all of that. That's another thing that seems to be going really well, but I know you can always use more. So um, we will we will help you get the word out um, as these events for volunteer opportunities um, arise. But um, love that and love that it's going well. But um, I know that you know if I can add to your wish list, more people, more the time please yeah definitely like just like stewardship just educating the public on what it means to be a good steward of the park and simple things they can do to really give back to the park and we are also trying we get the brook the park has no um the park embraces a lot of different communities we have very diverse um communities that use the park although we want to make sure that all communities feel that the park is for them and feel a sense of belonging and access and we are looking to strengthen relationships with different um, community leaders to make sure we're hearing from everyone who uses the park. Um, and I actually, I think Sean, I was just talking to you about really trying to make inroads with the um, South Asian community in Kensington. And um, we've been making a lot of inroads with, you know, communities in Flatbush and PLG. So there are community groups or community leaders that are interested in having their voice heard and having and giving feedback on the park. Um, my colleague Alexa McKenzie and I are really interested in hearing from them. You heard that, Shahid Khan? Eric, do you believe you have a question? Fire away. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, oh, wow, you guys are doing awesome. So thank you so much. Um, uh, I was uh, scouring the participatory budget maps like for cool projects. Um, and and I was in the park recently right by that pre ground fit thing, and it was like coming together. And I was curious if, uh, and forgive me if this is something you guys have already uh already working on but um the connectivity of the bike lanes from the park through to uh, argyle and rugby i mean just that spot over there where the where it goes across caton like you have to drag your bike between cars um real nightmare right for all the bikers who are all trying to come to the park and i was looking at the parade ground fit and i was like oh man you know this is where everybody rides their bike they ride right past the parade ground fit on their bike because they got to drag their bikes up on the sidewalk and then they drive through the gigantic puddle. In yeah, I think that's the state of good repair. Are you talking about the path where like the parking lot is where the police are? Like the if truth is going from yeah. Park Circle to Gaten? Exactly. exactly. That, it's, that's it's, what it's, I think. I don't want to misspeak and I'll go back to Sean to reconfirm it. I think that's the state of good repair project that's happening right now is they're creating a that's the project they're improving the path there. Um, I want to uh, triple check that because I'm afraid I, I might I, be speaking. But Deborah, that that jives with my memory of um, of the walkthrough with Christian and um, and I think there's also a DOT is repaving. So the state of good repair that the underneath the parade ground is subterranean, and then DOT is going to repave. 
and that's the spot. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm about 99.9% .9 certain that's the path that's being repaired right now. It's actually, I think the work has started on it. I was told that the, that the construction has started on that. I guess my question is, are bike lanes and bike transport being considered in that? Uh, That's a DOT question, Eric, and we are working okay. to get the bikes team to come to a transportation committee meeting. Um, so, so stay tuned and I'll keep you posted for sure. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Eric. Liz, go ahead. I'm sure it's on the bikes. Hey, yeah, I was just gonna say, like from the transfer, you know, that's a, a a common complaint I hear often as well. I think I think the reason Eric might be bringing it up is when there is a um, restoration of the parade grounds to put a dedicated place to get from the state of good repair um, path you're speaking of to the actual connections around the area. It's very hard probably to, we've heard from DOT often that it'd be very hard to do that on Caton because it's a truck route, it's very narrow. Um, but, you know, right now people are biking on sidewalks through the parade ground or just south of the parade ground. And just, you know, if there's a restoration that includes a, a design, I think there, it, it would be wise to consider making a true dedicated space instead of that. So what I'd say is, I'm sorry, Steve isn't on the call, my former co-chair of transportation, but perhaps, you know, when the safety study, the roadway safety study is done, maybe a presentation before the transportation committee on that and then the bike lane issue. Uh, might be in order. So just That's a interesting. I need to get, I feel like Sean knows more than I do about this pathway project, but um, I need to find out a little bit more about that myself. And I will say like anything around the perimeters of any of the parkland, whether it's the Prairie Ground or Prospect Park proper is DOT. Um, we have been like our restoration of Ocean Avenue. We've been working very closely with DOT. It's going to include like protected bike lanes and we did the same thing on Flatbush working with them and I know they either have done or are about to do Parkside. Um, so it's not clear to me um, how it works within the parade ground versus around the perimeter of it and how that all comes together. But I can try to get more information and work with Sean and make sure someone gets back to you and Barton, we're happy to, yeah, once we have that. Yeah, that sounds like a good together, presentation you know. for transportation committee. Yeah. Um, I do want to try to start tying this up. Uh, Dwayne, you've been kindly watching the chat for me. Anything you want to bring out there? Uh, and can you hear me, Dwayne? Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Um, no, we have one question from Liz um, earlier for the uh, folks at DEP, but that's a question that, uh, Sean, I'm hoping you can capture. Um, it was about um, flood damage claims sent to the comptroller's office and um if any of them what, what are the metrics around them being paid out um that may be they may not even be dep that may be more the comptroller's office um so maybe yeah, there anything out. recently on the parks discussion no just um okay. there's no questions outside of that uh there's no other okay questions. then shaheed you just raised your hand go ahead yes sir uh, actually i just want to make a request that if you kindly make any uh, p uh, presentation about the PS217 community uh, park. So, because Pakistani community is really affected from uh, that park is still under renovation, a lot of machinery. So, if you kindly arrange a meeting uh, with the concerned staff, so this will be highly appreciated. Thank you very much. Got it. Then, if there's nothing else pertaining to the parks discussion, then I'm just going to make the one re-announcement of the Uma Park Reconstruction Public Input Meeting taking place on December 14th at 7 p.m. by Zoom. Um, this has been, I believe, on our requests for a number of years, and Sean has been banging the drum for this one for quite some time. So the more CB14-related people who can show up and offer input, I think the better things will be. Anything you want to add to that, Sean? No, all good there. Okay. Then with that, I guess I will call the meeting to a close. If there is a motion to adjourn. Motion. Yes. Florencia. And a second. Then we are adjourned at 821. Thank you all again for joining us. It's been a lot of information and something to chew on. And if you have thoughts, get them either to me or to Sean or to Dwayne. And that's it. Thanks very much and good night.
Good thanks, night, everybody. everyone. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Alexis McKenzie. Good to Bye. see you. Good night. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Great Good night. presentation Good night. for all departments. Good night, Don Marie.